Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Roisin, and thank you, uh, Graham, for asking me to speak uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first week of, that I started the HRB-funded PhD in Health Services Research was also the week of the first emergency budget in October 2008. And one of the most controversial measures of all austerity budgets was the withdrawal of universal medical cards for people over 70 years of age. There followed a range of protests. Actually, I think the one in Western Row where an older person took the mic off the Minister of State is perhaps the most explosive image, but lots of images of these protests where really the older people terrified the body politic, protesting in churches and on the streets outside Dolaren, resulting in political U-turn after political U-turn of the initial budget announcement. And while the initial position was held in that universal medical cards for over 70 year olds were withdrawn, in the end, the income levels were raised so high as a response to the protests that most older people over 70 held onto their cards. Just uh, 16,000 older people out of about 325,000 people over 70 at the time lost their cards as a result of that budget announcement. Very little of the intended savings were achieved and the government were to pay a very hard political price for it. That week, coincidentally, was the first time I was asked to cover the health aspects of the budget on radio in RTE. And because the medical cards fiasco became the budget story of that October 2008, I got asked into RTE day after day. And because I was doing a PhD, I was able to go into RTE uh, day after day. And this led me to being offered a weekly health slot on RTE Radio 1's Drive Time programme, where I covered the health story of the week, or indeed the health story of my choosing, every week for seven years. Uh, and so my radio work began at exactly the same time as my PhD studies. And this was an amazing opportunity in that it allowed me to explain and hopefully help the public understand the problems and indeed sometimes the solutions to our very peculiar health system. But it didn't always make for easy work. The media tends to portray stories in black and white, whereas often what good health research does is throw some light on those thousand shades of grey in between. And in fact, I wanted to entitle my presentation something about a thousand shades of grey, and I googled it to find the origin, and my advice is don't google anything with shades of grey in it. Okay? Um, <laughs> But one of the many challenges uh, for health researchers is to analyse and understand those shades in between black and white and to explain them in a way so that they're useful to policy makers, to health service leaders, to health service managers, to our political leaders and to the public. My PhD, as Roisin mentioned, was an in-depth health policy making analysis related to three policies which increased the privatisation of hospital care in the early 2000s. And this found little, if any, evidence was used to inform the three policies that I analysed. It found instead personalised, covert policy making processes driven by the ideology of the political economy of the time. even finished my PhD uh, when I was in that total blur of confusion as you are when you're finishing a PhD, Steve Thomas hired me on the Resilience Project, uh, which had been operating for about uh, a year at this time, which uh, Steve and Sarah Barry and Connor Keegan and Charles Normand were working on. And Steve had had the foresight to pitch for funding to the HRB to monitor the impact of the crisis on health. And this was in an era when health budgets all over the OECD were only going in one direction, and that was up. So man monitoring the impact of those significant cuts provided a nat natural experiment that wasn't just of interest to Irish policymakers, but to the European Union, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, and subsequently the Troika. And Ireland, along with Portugal, Ireland, Greece and Spain, really we became the canaries in the pit of what happens when relentless cuts are made to the health budget. Most of those cuts, had ver of which most of those cuts had very little evidence behind them, and I think cuts which we are still bearing the brunt of today. One aspect of the Resilience Project was to gather indicators and publish them on our website. Um, this slide 
over to the right, has appeared. And we have updated it since, and I keep on sending it updated versions to people, but the old one keeps on. Still, it was used at a conference in recent weeks, although well now out of date. Um, and what this shows is that the health system managed to do more with less for the first few years of the crisis. And then come 2012, 2013, the health system had no choice but to do less with less. And you'll see that come 2013, the only bit that's going up, you can't see the detail of it, I don't want you to, but it's emergency department. And that remains the case today. The only place where the activity is continuing to drive is the only place where they've no control over. You can't close the emergency department, you can't cancel the emergency department. So it has continued to go uh, north. And indeed, I believe that Tony O'Brien giving evidence to the Committee uh, on Future Healthcare this morning uh, described how hospitals could end up just providing uh, care for people admitted through the emergencies if current trends aren't addressed. So our language from more with less to less with less became the policy and the political and the health service language. And we have been told by the most senior personnel involved that this work contributed to making the case for the budget, the health budget, not to be cut in 2015. Another important piece of work we did as part of the Resilience Project was to look and to quantify the extent of the transfer of costs from the state onto people due to a range of decisions made during those budgets. And this work was published in The Lancet in May 2014. And we found that nearly 450 million more was paid out of, pockets, out of pocket by citizens uh, in 2014 than had been in 2008 directly as a result of just a few changes, the removal of medical cards for over 70s, new prescription charges, higher inpatient charges, higher emergency department charges, and increasing the drug threshold for drugs, which went from 70 to 144, I think. And the day that this research was published, Charles Norman got a very, very early morning phone call from an official in the Department of Health who was extremely unhappy with this publication and asked could the figures be sent over to them because they didn't agree with the finding. We sent over the spreadsheet and we heard very little after. And that same official, I was, ended up in a room with that same official a while later, and they told me not only were the figures correct, that perhaps we underestimated the transfer of costs onto people, but the department hadn't realised the extent of the transfer of costs onto people until we had published that data. And so to the current project that I coordinate in Trinity, Pathways to Universal Healthcare. Once again, Steve Thomas is the principal investigator, Sarah Barry, Charles Normand, uh, and myself were the co-applicants. And when we pitched for this project, universal health insurance was flavour of the month. It could reasonably have been argued at that point in time that universal health care was yesterday's research project. However, one year into our research project, the ESRI costings on universal health insurance were published at which point the den then Minister, Leo Vradker, stated, and I quote him, the high costs for that particular model of health insurance are not acceptable now, nor any time in the future. And with that, universal health insurance was officially abandoned. And once again, universal health care re-entered the policy and the political domain. And we have done initial analysis for this project uh, looking at what has happened to universalism since this original intent of it in the 2011 Programme for Government, and we found that the system is actually less universal now than it was in 2011. All parties, except for one political party, campaigned for this year's general election, advocating some form of universal health care. The Programme for Government, published last May, committed to establish an Oireachtas all-party committee to develop a cross-party consensus, and again I quote, on a single long-term vision plan for healthcare over a 10-year period. And it went on to state, it is envisaged that the work of the Oireachtas Committee would allow the new partnership government to make a final decision on the best way forward to finance universal healthcare. Subsequently, Roisin Shortall drafted an all-party motion to set up the Oireachtas Committee, which was adopted by government when all other parties, apart from Fine Gael, supported the motion. And 
very strategically, you could argue, that that motion then became the terms of reference for the Oireachtas Committee, including, and I quote, the need to establish a universal single-tier service where patients are treated on the basis of health need rather than ability to pay. And this committee, as most people in this room will be aware of, has been working away since July under the skilled uh, chairing of Deputy Roisin Shortall, and I'm not just saying that because you're in front of me, Roisin. Um, and our project team, Pathways to Universal Healthcare, has had uh, the opportunity to have two formal presentations and discussions with that committee, and they are due to report early in the new year. Obviously, January, when you're set up in July, is absolutely an impossible time frame for the committee to reach a consensus and produce a 10-year plan for reform, including the delivery of a universal health system. And certainly, the Pathways project doesn't have all the answers to many of the tricky issues facing the committee. Uh, but at the moment, we are currently facilitating a range or a series of expert-led workshops with that committee. And uh, it is both a privilege and a huge opportunity to be engaged and feeding in the work of our research into that work. And in fact, when we had our first workshop last week with Roisin in the Dáil, uh, Roisin told us that it was apparently historic in that no Oireachtas Committee on anything has ever had an expert-led workshop, which says a lot about our government-making processes. Um, but I give you this example because perhaps this work is a really good example of putting evidence into into policy, that there is never a time when we will have the perfect knowledge we need, but we do need to contribute towards it. This morning, uh, Simon Harris very boldly, you could suggest, made the statement, and I quote him, no longer can we have hokey pokey policy decisions. We must follow the evidence. And I suggest that the challenge is not just for policymakers and for politicians. The challenge is for health researchers. It's for those of us in the room. It is our responsibility as publicly funded researchers to provide evidence, to make that evidence accessible, to communicate it clearly to the public, to politicians, to policymakers, to health service managers and leaders so that they have no choice but to use it. Thank you very much.